I'm Michael Eager. I'm the president of San Francisco Regional Mensa. Happy to have you all here. Happy to have our speaker. Um, without any more ado, um, let me introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Natalie Tellis is a researcher who studies the connections between human genetics, human diversity, and human disease. She holds a bachelor's in mathematics and one in cell biology from University of California at Davis. And her PhD is in biomedical informatics from Stanford, just on the street. Her research focuses on ways of following evolution's fingerprints to the levers that affect human biology and disease. She is currently a research scientist in a pharmaceutical company. And I hope you're doing one of the um, uh, COVID vaccines. I'm, I'm not helping out, although I'm very excited to, uh, I, I was really excited this week to hear so much positive initial news about the vaccine. I think that uh, was the best news of the week in a very busy news week. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me, having me today. Um, I'm really happy to be here, uh, even though, you know, I'm not physically here in person. And I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk to you all about something I'm really passionate about, which is the connection between human genetics, human history, and our future. I want to talk about three main things today um, in the hour or so that we have. Um, first, I love that one of them hasn't appeared on my slide yet, but I swear it will. Mm, there we go. Um, okay, uh, so the first one I want to talk about is how we understand and use our DNA. I want to lay out some of the basics of just, you know, build the foundation for how scientists are decoding, reading, and interpreting DNA. And then I want to talk a little bit about how we use that interpretation to understand our past and humanity's history and how we can use it as sort of a time machine to understand where humanity has come from. And then at the end, I want to touch on our DNA and our future and how human genetics and the technologies associated are going to continue shaping humanity for um, as far forward as I'm willing to predict. Uh, but before we get to all that, let's start with the basics and build out from there. So how do we read and understand human genetic code? So I want to start by introducing a couple of the core things we know about the human genome to share with you the assumptions that we make going into understanding it as scientists studying it. And I wanna start with sort of the core first building blocks. First off, the genome, which is all of the DNA in your cell, um, contains almost all the instructions in one form or another for making a human being. And it packages them up in almost every kind of cell. And that packaging system is very complex. I think Marie Kondo would be very impressed. Um, it's an extremely organized, system. So first, these instructions live in a dedicated place in the cell. And that's called the nucleus. And there, they're broken up into very tightly condensed and packed down pieces, which are called chromosomes. And if you were to take a chromosome and carefully unpack and unspool just a piece of it, there we, you would find the actual language of DNA, the bases A, T, G, and C. Those are shorthands for really complex chemical compounds that pair up and down a really tough, resilient spine, kind of like a binding, which protects that DNA from damage and wear as it's used to shape almost all of the biological functions in the cell. Um, there are billions of letters of DNA in every single cell. There are about six billion, just a little bit more, in every single one of our cells. Um, and the kind of core question of human geneticists is what do they do? The, the most well understood parts of our genome code for proteins. We call those parts genes usually. I think of genes as sort of recipes for proteins. They're read by machinery that is shared by every single form of life that we know of on earth. And these proteins perform tons and tons of different kinds of functions in the cell, although they're not the only things that have functions in the cell. Um, and notably variation in your DNA, like variation in the recipe, changes um, the kind of precise shape and function of these proteins and so can alter exactly how they work. But now I want to introduce you to three facts which I think really outline the core mystery of human genetics. So I told you that all our DNA, the human genome, was super organized, but that doesn't mean that it's very well understood. The first mysterious fact, there are only about 20,000 human genes, maybe a little bit more depending on you count, on, on how you count them up. 
Um, and for comparison, a parasitic stomach worm, like a nematode, has the exact same amount of genes, just like maybe one or 2,000 fewer. So how is it that this actually like fairly small amount of genes forms the complexity and diverse differences between those organisms, let alone how do they explain the complexity we see in humans? So this is one part of the mystery. The second part, I told you that in every cell, there are billions of bases of DNA, but almost none of those billions of bases of DNA actually include proteins. About only about one to 2% of the human genome has anything to do with proteins and the rest of it totally does not. So what is it doing? To be honest, I think most geneticists would tell you right now, we have no idea. We know that at least some parts of it govern exactly when and where in the body certain pieces of DNA are used. So just because your pantry includes flour, for example, it doesn't mean you have to put it in every single recipe. In the same way, genes can be used in a context specific way. Not every gene is used in every cell. But what does that mean for, uh, you know, what, what does that mean for that 98% of the human genome? What is it doing to create these vast differences? So you think knowing these things, that we'd have to be super different from one another in these genes to explain the kind of diversity that you see in people, you know, different heights, propensities towards disease, anything you could think of. Um, and yet humans resoundingly are not. We are not related, but we are about 99.9% .9 identical. So if you took the letters in my genome and picked any of you guys, let's say Stuart, Stuart, if I compare my DNA to yours, we're gonna have almost exactly the same letters, even though we're clearly not the same person. Um, and so this is kind of the, I, I think of these three things as these key pieces of the mystery of human genetics. Um, how does this complex code that we carry and that we cannot live without actually make us who we are, so different and yet so alike? Our genome bears the fingerprints of our history and the instructions for our present, but given these complexities, understanding how to unravel it is not going to be easy. So before we talk about what scientists have learned already about that history, I wanna to touch on some of the technology I'll refer to when I say reading the genetic code. So there are a lot of different ways of reading the human genome. And I wanna to touch on them because they're often thrown around in popular science and we have contact with them because of consumer genetic testing and also because they determine how much information you're actually working off of when you are reading the genome. So a first one that I think is really, really common is called genotyping. So I just told you, you know, two slides ago that humans are 99.9% .9 alike, right? So what that means is if I read your genome or if I read my genome, 99.9% .9 of what I'd be reading would be totally not specific to me. It would be general to all of humanity. So genotyping is kind of a technological answer to that. Um, what you do when you genotype is you pick places where you know beforehand that people tend to be different. So maybe at one place in the genome, almost everyone, maybe even everyone in the world has the letter C. So we don't necessarily want to read that place because we know what's going to happen. If you put in a human piece of DNA, you'll get out a C. Um, but maybe at some other place in the genome, we know that about 50% of people have an A and the other 50% of people have, tend to have a T. That means that particular piece of the genome will be a lot more informative about people's individual differences because they're likely to differ there. So if we look at just that variable place that we know about, we can start looking at those kinds of patterns of differences. Genotyping is really commonly used, especially for studying human ancestry. So if any of you guys have ever done a DNA test like Ancestry or 23andMe, you've probably already been genotyped. Um, on the other hand, we have sequencing. Um, this is an approach to reading genetic code that involves reading it really directly in a row, not by picking out individual pieces and letters to check on specifically. But there are still a few nuances here. So the kind of first kind of sequencing I want to mention that's really the most specific is targeted sequencing. And I think of targeted sequencing as kind of like opening a book and reading one specific page. So if you've ever received a test for mutations in a particular gene, like uh, especially ones like BRCA1 or 2, where um, many differences in that one gene might indicate susceptibility to something like cancer, that was probably targeted sequencing. That was technology saying, we want to pick out BRCA1 or BRCA2. We want to read that gene specifically. Um, 
So you're not really seeing very much of the whole genome when you do that. I would say it's probably less than, uh, it's, you know, it depends on exactly what you're targeting, but it might be very little. Um, so you're not really seeing much of the DNA, but you're getting a very good and specific look at a specific piece of that DNA. Um, a more comprehensive way of reading pieces of the genome might be to say, to, to focus on the ones we understand best, those are genes, um, and then to say, okay, we're going to read not just one specific place in the genome, but every specific place. We're going to read every single gene. Um, so to read around the genome and look just for the sequences of genes is called exome sequencing. Um, but remember, even exome, which is reading all those 20,000 genes, uh, still is only a really small fraction of your genome because your genome has so much else in it. And so finally, if you're really enterprising as a scientist, you want to really read every single letter in someone's genetic code, that's called whole genome sequencing. That unmasks all the individual letters. Um, and as you might imagine, given the amount of information you have going from exome to whole genome sequence, there's a really, really huge cost associated with that in terms of the kind of performance of an experiment. But you also learn everything about someone. If we rely on our understanding of human diversity to inform exactly where we look, then we're not going to discover anything that's new outside of our understanding for the most part. So whole genome sequencing is a really important technology for understanding genetic diversity. All right, so with this technology in our back pocket, we can start using it to decipher the past. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna just um, answer, I think an implicit question, which is why does DNA from people who are alive today, or you know, even from people alive a thousand or 10,000 years ago, let us look into the past beyond the moment in which they lived? Um, and the answer to that is deceptively simple. Um, when your parents passed on DNA to you and your siblings, their genomes were not passed on exactly. Their chromosomes were remixed as they were inherited. The chromosomes get mixed around as they're being passed on to you and your siblings, which is part of why siblings aren't totally identical to one another. Now, siblings do share a lot of DNA, much more than two strangers, even though we two strangers might already share 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Um, and they definitely share enough for an algorithm to pick up that you two are related, which is how a lot of genetic genealogy services work. Um, but the kind of important piece to realize here is this means that every single time DNA is passed on, it's remixed a little bit, but you retain a lot of the information that was already in that genetic code. And the fact that DNA is inherited this way and mixed up over time means that its history is passed on from parent to child. Now, families share patterns of history, but so do populations, which you might think of as really just kind of big groups of families that are all mixing with one another. And you can imagine that if people are 99.9% .9 the same, it takes a ton of nuance and care to interpret those shared patterns. But when we can see them, we can use those patterns in whole populations to understand those populations' histories. Okay, so this brings us to the second destination in this talk. Now that we know how we read DNA, what we know about it, and why it might reflect history, what can DNA actually tell us about our past? Um, are there any questions so far? Hopefully some of this is familiar, um, or even a lot of it may be familiar. Yes, we have a couple questions. Uh, Judy asks, what method do the commercial companies that look at uh, ancestry and match um, match you with families other people use? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, so it depends a little bit on the company and on the specific test that you're buying from them, um, but a majority of them are using genotyping. And in part, you can imagine why that is as a cost thing. If what you want to know are the patterns in someone's genome, then looking at just the, you know, couple million places where you'll find a pattern versus billions of places is a really cost-effective way to figure out exactly what someone might share with other people. But the amount of, what, what's kind of shocking about that is the amount of information actually being used to find even really, really distant relatives is actually a very small portion of all of the genetic code that you have. Yeah, uh, the question I have is I keep hearing that um, we have one to 4% Neanderthal DNA, 
and ooh, we will uh, get what, to that. <laughs> we will get to that. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, no, but I mean, feel free to feel free to ask. I'm happy to take a motivating question. Sure. Uh, what does it if we're all 99% the same? What does it mean to have 4% Neanderthal or Denisovan or whatever? Yeah, you know, um, I, I kind of say these things and I always think they're interesting because, yeah, you know, people say, oh, parents and children share 50% of their DNA. And I'm like, well, actually share 99.9% .9 of your DNA um, with literally a stranger. So what does it mean that parents share 50? And likewise, what does it mean that we are, you know, 1% to 4% archaic? Um, the way that a lot of those things are calculated is kind of um, in the in the space of those shared patterns. So we are extremely similar to one another, and we're actually also pretty similar to Neanderthals and Denisovans. The way that you might calculate what percentage of your genome you share with them is to go along a chromosome and say, okay, well, almost all of these bases are gonna match exactly, but those, those particular places where people tend to vary are good diagnostic sites for the idea for exactly where a pattern might come from. So let's say I have one variant here that comes from a Neanderthal and then a thousand more letters that are totally exactly the same as every human. Then the next variant also seems to come from a Neanderthal. Then a thousand more variants, just, you know, they're literally identical in everyone. What we assume is when we see those two variable sites that come from a Neanderthal, that probably that entire chunk of your chromosome represents a pattern that was inherited by one. And by kind of inferring the size of those chunks from those patterns, that's where we get these one to 4% numbers. Does that make sense? A bit, yes. We might, I think we'll, we'll get to this in the next section. So we might, we might uh, return to the question if that sounds good. Good. Um, another question, how accurate is matching for forensic criminology? Ooh, <laughs> we'll talk about that too. Uh, <laughs> so um, it depends on the, it, it depends very heavily on the population and the strength of the match. So, um, you know, as I was kind of alluding to, when you share DNA with a sibling, you share a really, really big pattern. And so you can be very confident if you see patterns that large, that the only way to share something so big and so consistent in your genome is to share it in a way that we call um, identical by descent. Meaning the only way that you could be so identical to someone else is if you share some kind of genealogical origin. If you have that segment because it was handed down to you both from a common ancestor and you are their descendant. Um, but the more distantly related you become, the more difficult it becomes to tell those differences apart from differences that you would have just by being part of the same population. Like I said, populations are sort of like really big families. So for me, for example, I come from a European Jewish population. Our population has been historically small. And one of the consequences of that is that we are even more similar to one another than strangers are. So if you were to tell me, hey, Natalie, this person is your sixth cousin, I would say, well, it's very difficult to know if that's really true or to know if that's just because they come from the same population. Whereas sixth cousins in other populations might actually be much more easy to tell apart from random noise. So the context, the, the kind of big answer is, as all scientists will always say, it depends. But to give you a sense of the intuition, the closer related people are, um, especially immediate family, first, second, third cousins, we can be really certain about those relationships. They're much bigger than chance. How certain we are about further and more distant relationships depends a lot on what population two people are from and also on the quality of our, uh, our understanding of the diversity of that population. Good. Do you want to continue taking questions or do you want to uh, move forward and yeah, let catch me up? <laughs> Let me go forward and uh, we're, because I think uh, these questions are very excellent. They're anticipating some of the things we'll talk about. So I'll see if I can answer a few more questions with the talk and then we'll pause again. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Excellent. Alrighty. Um, okay, so what can DNA tell us about our past? Um, 
I, I want to share a couple of pieces of knowledge in this space, and I can tell, I, I hope that I'll be able to touch on some of your questions as part of it. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is give you just a flavor for what questions are being asked in human genetics right now. And I'm going to focus specifically on human genetics and human history, because I think to some extent, human genetics and modern medicine is a little bit more widely understood, and there's a lot more discussion about Mendelian inherited disease. So I want to talk instead about why the genome today allows us to kind of time travel and understand the past. And I'm going to split my discussion up into talking about three main categories of kind of time travel style questions. The first is where we've been. The second is who we've met along the way. So we'll talk about Neanderthals and Denise Vince there. And then the third is where we're going next. So let's start with where we've been. Um, we're going to talk about the story of human migration. Uh, I'm going to guess that some of you in this very curious audience are familiar with the out of Africa model of human migration, which kind of um, generally suggests that humans moved out of Africa and settled the rest of the world within the last 100,000 years. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for that idea in general, which I'm kind of laying out here in this diagram. So this figure summarizes some of the examples of what anthropologists and evolutionary biologists have been able to learn about migration paths of humans out of Africa. And the out of Africa hypothesis suggests that some small group of people left Africa and migrated out. And then that small group of people split further and further as different migratory paths kind of populated the world and sort of fractionated. Um, there's still a lot of disagreement about whether one or multiple waves of people migrated out, but the evidence that they migrated out and then fractured afterwards is really clear. Um, I want to show you an example of, and so, uh, so one of the consequences of that um, is that there's a really, really big imprint of this migration history on our DNA. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons for that is kind of the process that I described. First, we were sort of a big family living in one area, right? And then just a couple of us moved out. And then just a couple of those people moved on to the next place and the next and so on. So our family size and our kind of diversity from uh, one another got smaller and smaller as you moved further out. Um, and there are really beautiful pieces of genetic evidence for this. So um, here I'm showing you a figure from a paper from a couple of years ago. And the dots here represent the places of origin for about 500 people, just a little less, from around the world. And scientists sequenced their whole genomes. Um, but instead of showing you information about the whole genome, I want to just show you like a piece of summary about what they learned from those whole genomes. And I think this is a really elegant summary of how genetics reflects some of this migration. So let's look at this chart on the right here. Um, on the x-axis, which is labeled on the top, we have the distance in kilometers from the capital of Ethiopia, which it sounds like a very specific thing, but it's a good proxy for the distance from the birthplace of modern humanity. And on the y-axis is a measure of genetic diversity. So the higher you are on this y-axis, the more diverse your genome is and the kind of larger source population you come from. And what you can see is that as you look at people who today are from places that are increasingly further and further away from Addis Ababa, their genomes are less and less diverse. Why is that? It's because of that process I just described. As you get further away from the kind of birthplace of modern humanity, then that means that you descend from a increasingly smaller and smaller group of people leaving, splitting off, migrating. Um, so there's a lot of really good evidence for how people moved around the globe, a lot of which actually now is genetic evidence and not just anthropological evidence, which is really interesting. Um, but, you know, one of the things I want to do since I have the opportunity is to talk about sort of the bleeding edge of this kind of work. And so I want to dive a little bit deeper into an example of a human migration mystery that's a little bit closer to home by talking about the story of a settlement of an island just off the coast of the Americas. Um, so Rapa Nui, which I've circled here on this map from a paper that came out just in July of this year, is an island off the coast of South America. Um, when the Dutch explorers came to it, it was called Easter Island by them. So I think that's a familiar name to many of us. But it had actually been settled a really long time before by its indigenous population who call it Rapa Nui. So that's what I'll do in this portion of the talk. But that's actually part of the whole mystery. So the Dutch who found it had to cross thousands of miles to get to it. Um, and yet they were clearly not the first to arrive. 
Um, but Rapa Nui is a really serious challenge to get to, so it's remarkable that people managed to come to it at all. Um, as you can see, it's 2,000 miles off the coast of South America, and it's also over 1,000 miles from the nearest Polynesian islands, which are Mangareva and then Rapa Iti. Um, so there's been this really long-standing anthropological question about where its indigenous residents came from. Um, and a paper that came out a few months ago in July of this year set out to find out by studying their DNA. Um, so we obviously can't take a time machine back to Rapa Nui and just wait there for indigenous settlers to arrive and then see which direction they were coming from. Um, but their history, like all of ours, has to be written in their DNA because that history is being passed down and kind of inherited. So scientists can use shared pop patterns in populations to point to shared history and shared descent. Now, remember that these patterns are pretty subtle, but I want to give you a sense of how algorithms de detect them work, in part because they're used really widely in these kind of commercially available ancestry services. Um, so the way that most of these algorithms work is they rely on some kind of gold standard. So as an example here, I think you see these kinds of chromosomes that I've colored in like Easter egg colors, uh, sort of green, pink, and blue. Um, so uh, let's say that we have a gold standard and we know that there are some people whose chromosomes for sure represent Central Native American ancestry. Um, let's say we have some that we know for sure represent European ancestry, some that for sure represent Polynesian ancestry. So with this gold standard in place, we can use really sophisticated statistical pattern matching to ask two questions. If we take a chromosome from Rapa Nui, in this case, um, second from the right, and we go down that chromosome and we look and match patterns, which of these populations in the gold standard set that we're looking at um, do Rapa Nui residents actually share common patterns with? This can tell us a little bit about where they're from. Um, and that can give us a sense of the history of the population, which of these populations is sort of its closest cousin. Secondly, if the chromosomes of indigenous Rapa Nui residents have common patterns with many of the populations, we can ask a second question, which is a little bit subtler, which is how big are the chunks of those patterns? The more broken up a pattern is, the longer it's been remixed and remixed and remixed at every stage as that DNA was passed down. Whereas if a pattern is new, it won't be nearly as mixed up. So if we learn which populations these residents match and then what the kind of landscape of that pattern matching is, that can tell us a lot about where they come from and what kinds of contact they've had with other populations. Um, so let's take a look at the answers to these questions. Um, we'll go first to the first question. So I'm going to show you a chart from the paper here that represents each of the individuals in a population that was studied as a column. And then the percent of each pattern their genome contained is colored in that column. So it's not like kind of a linear representation of the, the genome. It's just like, okay, this person, for example, I'm showing you on the left um, people from in this study who are from Vanuatu, which is a Melanesian island, and you can see that most of them kind of have an 100% dark blue Melanesian column with a little bit of Polynesian ancestry um, and that kind of pattern matching through them. So let me unmask the rest of the chart. Um, so, uh, and just as an aside, um, I, I want to just say that the study authors here use genotyping in order to determine all of these pattern matches. And this kind of gets to that question about like, okay, well, which technology is used to do what kind of matching? So you might remember that genotyping has really little information about the genome overall. It's just scattered letters here and there. Um, but if you're smart about picking exactly which those letters are, then, and you include ones that tend to vary a lot, They'll represent these population-specific patterns really well. So let's look at this chart specifically. You can see that there are two groups of which represent slices of the population of Rapa Nui, one which was taken in 1994 and another one taken about 20 years later. So let's take a look at what we see in the chart. Um, in both populations, we can see splotches of almost every color pattern, right? Native American, Polynesian, and European. 
But we can also see that the amount of Polynesian ancestry is very, very high in almost all the individuals. And that suggests that no matter what, the Polynesian islanders are very likely to have made their way to Rapi Nui and been its individual settlers, which again means a nonstop sea voyage in kind of human prehistory of over a thousand miles, which is incredible. But something the scientists noticed about this made them a little curious. What you can see in both of these populations is there's an appreciable amount of Native American ancestry. And so they wondered, is that a contact, you know, a consequence of recent population contact or, you know, kind of um, European colonial era population contact, or is it something historical? So we can turn to the second question I talked about, how mixed up is that pattern to find out? So here, these patterns were really represented genome-wide, so we'd get one percentage. Each bar just says what matches each, each pattern. But let's take a more granular look at one particular individual. Um, so I'm showing you a chart here that these researchers made where they colored um, the content of just one participant in their study. Um, they colored their entire genome chromosome by chromosome according to which population small pieces of that chromosome matched all in a row. So in this case, they're doing exactly what um, we kind of discussed before. They're going along the chromosome, they're reading through and saying, okay, um, a lot of this chromosome is the same, but oh, this particular spot, this matches a European ancestry. Okay, now we're going along, oh yeah, the next variable spot matches European ancestry really well. And when you do that along the whole genome, you can do something called chromosome painting, which is what this is. This is sort of an illustrated chromosome where you see that ancestry. So importantly, I'd like to point out that all of these chromosomes look like they have two halves, and that's because each of us inherits two copies of each chromosome, one from each parent. So they're just showing the chromosomes kind of complementary to one another here in order to illustrate both of those halves. And what you can see here is that a lot of the pieces which are red, which represent European ancestry, are huge. In fact, in this person, they're typically entire chromosomes, which which suggests to me that this person's European background is extremely recent. In fact, I think it's most likely they have one parent who's entirely European. But look at the other chromosomes that are kind of a mix of blue and teal, right? They are mostly blue, sure, but they have lots and lots of pieces of Native American ancestry that's mixed in with that Polynesian ancestry. And it's not just one or two pieces here or there, they're really actually sprinkled all around. So this suggests that while the European parts of this one genome come from a really recent event, the Native American patterns could represent an older history. The question is how much older? So I was showing you an example of just one genome in the last chart, but let's instead look across all of the genomes. And here we're gonna filter out ones with recent European ancestry like the one I just showed you. Now the picture gets a lot clearer. So on the x-axis, we have a measure of how big a chunk of the genome is. So the more to the left a point is, the smaller a chunk it is, the more to the right it is, the bigger a chunk it is. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the number of chunks that were found in that particular size range. So what you can see in blue is that the chunks of Polynesian ancestry tend to be huge, which is not surprising at all. That's where most of the population comes from, and that's still a very big part of their background. But we also see that there are many small chunks of Native American ancestry in the whole population. It's not just in one person. And you could take an algorithm that models the process that mixes up those chunks as they're inherited and actually extrapolate in reverse. How long ago did this pattern join the population for it to be this mixed up now that we're seeing it? And when you do that, you get back this number that's kind of intermediate between 20 and 21 generations, which you can extrapolate with human generation times back to um, like 1380 AD, suggesting that actually not only did Polynesians sail and populate Rapa Nui, but also Native Americans from South America had to also have sailed there. They had to arrive hundreds of years before the Dutch in order to explain this genetic pattern. There's no other way to explain it, which is really, really remarkable. Um, so I hope this has illustrated to you how powerful DNA can be at unmasking parts of human history that are really unknown. Um, and I wanna take a moment to talk about another open question in the field of human genetics, which I think this one kind of alludes to. Um, along the way through that history, who have we encountered? Um, so uh, let's start with a really simple family tree here. 
So I keep saying that populations are like families. And so maybe you might think that, you know, the human family, the population of all humans could be super easy to put on a chart like this. Um, but let me show you what the most up-to-date example of the hominin family tree actually looks like. Uh, it's a lot messier. <laughs> so there are a couple of things to point out here. Um, and the way this family tree is kind of planned out, we start in the distant past at the bottom of this chart and then move forward into the present. So at the top, we get to the present day. Um, and so what you can see first off is there are tons and tons of branches. So we have a lot of cousins, um, but actually some of those branches split off and then they come back again, which is really interesting and unusual. Um, and we can't talk about all of the complexities of human history. It's really fascinating though, but we can focus on a particular part, um, the relationship between Homo sapiens, which is us, and their closest cousins, Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, so Neanderthals and Denisovans, I think um, at least some of you definitely know, but just to make sure we're all talking about the same cousins, uh, they're both populations of hominins that lived alongside modern humans as they were populating Eurasia, but that are extinct now. Um, however, they didn't leave Africa when we did. They're not like a separate migrating group. Um, as you can see on this family tree, they probably left Africa more like half a million years ago, whereas we left around the last 100,000 years. Um, and they came to, to interact with us when we um, left Africa as well and then encountered them living in Eurasia. So in order to study what that interaction, what that encounter actually means, um, I want to take a look at a couple of recent papers. Um, the first is a paper from April of this year that used over 27,000 whole genome sequences from Iceland. Um, so similar to the pattern matching that I was showing you before for the um, indigenous population of Rapa Nui, um, what they did instead of looking at the population of Rapa Nui and seeing how well it matched modern human populations, they looked at these 27,000 Icelandic individuals and looked at how well they matched the very scant few genetic records that we actually have of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, and so you can do the exact same kind of scanning, but instead of saying, oh, is this piece of your genome, does it match a European pattern? You can say, oh, does this match an archaic pattern? Um, and when you do that, and this is where that kind of number comes from, um, they found something that's been found over and over again in data sets about modern humans. And so that most of us have DNA that matches Neanderthal or other archaic sequences. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing you the amount of archaic DNA per genome measured in millions of bases. And that's done by that kind of extrapolative process, right? If you have a Neanderthal variant here and another one right next to it and next to it and so on and so forth with a lot of shared sequence in between, the likelihood is all of those represent Neanderthal DNA that's kind of come over in a chunk, not that it's swapping back and forth. Um, so what you can see, and I've kind of um, put a line on here to represent what about 1% of all your DNA looks like. So you can see that for most people, over 1% of their DNA matches the patterns that we find in these extinct human cousins, uh, which is a sign that our interaction was, let's say, very intimate. Um, and you can visualize that actually really similarly to what I was showing you before. Um, you can kind of paint it onto a chromosome. So here, each box represents just one chromosome. Um, and every single colored block represents a place where any human in those 27,000 plus had a pattern that matched that background. Now, and so you can see basically the whole chromosome is colored in some way. So it's really clear that we not only met our Neanderthal and Denisovan brethren, but the imprints of our meeting and sharing DNA are visible all over our genome today. Um, you can actually reconstruct most of what we know now about the Neanderthal genome from ancient genomes just by looking at people today, because I might have 2% of it, and then someone else might have a different non-overlapping 2% of it. You can literally kind of do genetic archaeology to reconstruct these ancient genomes from modern people now that we know about them. Um, I think that looking at this and seeing, okay, well, human chromosomes are so colored by these touch point interactions with um, archaic humans kind of begs the question, what is all that DNA doing? 
So I wanted to take a moment talking about that a little bit because um, there have been a few efforts to study this. I wanna talk about both a sort of bleeding edge one and a particularly classic one. So to talk about that classic one, let's go to, uh, let's talk about um, humans living in extreme conditions. One example of such an extreme condition is living at altitude, which the Tibetans have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. They live at an altitude of over about 15,000 feet year round. And this is shown to have a really negative physiological consequences for people who, like me, for example, are adapted to living near sea level. It puts really incredible pressures and strains on the cardiovascular system. And yet it's clear that the Tibetans do not suffer those negative consequences. So they're not just like used to dealing with those consequences, they actually don't deal with them. So how do Tibetans actually do it? Um, well, in order to understand that, scientists a few years ago compared the Tibetan population to their nearest genetic neighbors, which are the Han Chinese population. So for a lot of genes, they compared two numbers, which is a little bit um, confusing to understand, but let me explain. Um, here on the x-axis is the overall difference in a particular place in the genome between the Han Chinese and the Tibetan population. And it's a statistic we use to summarize in general how far two populations are in a particular area. Um, and you can see that that number is usually really small. On the y-axis is the biggest difference between any of the variants in that particular area. So like, for example, if you have a variant in one of these places that's at that's in 90% of the Tibetan population and 70% of the Han Chinese population, it would have a y-axis of 0.2. Now note here already that we're looking at like pretty extreme differences. Um, and so there's a couple of places where the genome is um, not too different, but there's also, or yeah, where the genome overall is not too different, but some of those individual variant differences are really wide. Um, and I'm circling one of them in particular um, because uh, EPAS1, this gene that one of these differences is in, is really critical for regulating the negative response um, of the cardiovascular system to unusually low uh, pressure and oxygenation. Um, so it's really likely that this difference is what actually ensures that the Tibetans don't experience cardiovascular stress. But what's really interesting about the variation at that particular um, gene is that if you look at the variants that kind of help have that beneficial effect and the variants around them, they don't look like they come from humans. It looks much more likely that they actually are variation that comes from Denisovans. And this is not super surprising. Um, one of the thoughts around how some of that genetic variation might affect us is the idea that like, well, you know, if the Denisovans already knew how to live at high altitude, then like, why do we need to reinvent the genetic wheel when we adapt to it? Maybe we can just kind of cheat out of their notes. Um, but this is just one example of what's going on with variation we inherited from our archaic cousins. Um, in, in a paper that I published in September this year, I tried to take a little bit more of a, a, a broader view, not just to find one example, but to learn a little bit more about the specific patterns. Um, so I compared the proportion of expected archaic variants from either Neanderthals or Denisovans in particular parts of the genome, um, where expected means sprinkled in at random to how many there actually are. So on the left, I'll show you what that looks like for parts of the genome that code for proteins, and each color will represent a different population. So you can see that in, you know, if um, they were really sprinkled in at random, you'd expect the number you see versus the number you expect to be one. But in all of these places and places that code for genes um, or in places that code for proteins, you see less than what you'd expect. Um, and what does that suggest? Well, when DNA from two parents, like one Neanderthal and one human mixes, that process is random. But over time, how much of that variation remains in the population is shaped not only by the forces of randomness, but also by evolution. So this missing DNA suggests that the forces of evolution are removing some of those archaic variants. But we've only looked at a little bit of the genome when we look at the parts that code for proteins, right? So if you look into that other 98% and you find some of the places in the genome that we suspect control the context where a gene is used, 
you can see that those archaic variants also are not as common there as you would expect, which is very unusual because if that 98% is really just like junk or trash that we're carrying around and the 2% is what matters, you'd think you'd totally be allowed to have this variation elsewhere, but you are not. Um, and so where are those variants really missing from? We can split up what we look at by not just asking, is this part of a DNA that's a light switch for a gene, even if it's not a gene, but by asking, what's the context of that switch? Is it a light switch in the brain? Is it a light switch in your muscle cells? Is it active in both? Um, and so in this chart, you can see the proportion of Neanderthal DNA that you'd expect on the x-axis and the proportion of Denisovan DNA that you'd expect on the y-axis. So we can tell that it's not that a particular kind of variation like from Denisovans is especially damaging um, and especially not permissible, but Neanderthal variation is okay. It's actually just that both are pretty similar, but both are missing from some really critical areas. Like there's an especially large amount of this missing expected variation in um, regulatory areas that control how genes are used in um, the brain, especially, and then also in muscle. Um, and then there's also a really similar relationship if you look not at where um, that context is, but at how many different kind of parts of the body or tissues it operates in. So on the x-axis here, we have just the number of tissues in the body affected by a variant. Doesn't matter which those tissues are. And you can see as that number gets higher, regardless of which ones they are, you have more and more missing variation, suggesting that evolution is cleaning house more and more aggressively. Um, so now just for a little bit, because I know that we're close on time, I want to touch on just how we learn about what's happening to humanity that's really close to the present day. Um, and we've talked a lot about how to learn where we've been and how to read history that's tens or hundreds of thousands of years old. But what do we know about what's happening to humans today? So there's a lot of conversation about what humanity's rapidly changing lifestyle is going to do to it, which is actually something that I research or have researched in particular. Um, and one takeaway from that that I'd say is that humanity is not actually undergoing its first or most massive technological revolution now. And that actually happened about 10,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture. Um, agriculture was a really powerful centralizer and it scaled much better to population centers than hunting and gathering, but it was a nutritional train wreck. Humans lost like six to 10 inches of height in a matter of just a few hundred years. It's actually suggested that our heights now, which are very tall, are just north of the average height that hunter-gatherers had. So we, we actually have been impacted by that for literally the last 10,000 years. So, but then that actually means that humanity has undergone a lot of really recent change. So do we actually have the power to see that? So, <laughs> Sorry, just being humorous. Okay, to, to answer that, uh, I wanted to spotlight some work from this year that focused on assembling a really big data set of ancient human DNA sequence. But this time when I'm saying ancient, I don't mean tens of thousands of years old, I mean just hundreds or maybe a few thousands of year old. So we're gonna go back to two points in time. One of them that's really critical is this incredible archeological site at the Battle of Talense. Um, this is a super, insane archaeological site, probably the first organized battle in human history, and it is a carnage. So this is a picture of what this site actually looks like in just one small quadrant of the super muddy battlefield. Archaeologists have found hundreds of bones, and a lot of those bones contain DNA that we can actually still analyze. So it can give us information about the genomes of people living well, I guess dying at this battle, but living during the times of this battle. So scientists wondered, can the DNA from that battle scene actually tell us anything about humans adapting to one of the most critical technologies of the last 10,000 years? And I don't mean the polio vaccine or the COVID vaccine or like the iPhone 12, I'm talking about milk. <laughs> so milk is a really incredible source of energy, one that typically isn't available to animals when they grow up. And so it's something we stopped being able to process. But when humans domesticated other mammals, they changed that. And milk was actually a viable source of energy in the adult diet. And so we know today that most humans that are descended from societies that domesticated milkable animals can drink milk because of genetic variation that they uh, now carry. 
So scientists wanted to use DNA to estimate how quickly that genetic variation arose after the um, creation of this technology, domesticated mammals, um, and then to try to understand how quickly that variation spread through the population. So they sequenced people from the Battle of Talense, which gives a snapshot of what DNA was like 3,200 years ago um, with DNA from medieval times. And they wanted to do this to ask, when did humans start adapting to take advantage of this new energy technology? So um, I'm showing you here a chart of samples from this study colored by their status for a variant in your DNA that enables you to digest or not digest lactose, which is a key sugar in milk. As you can see, only two of the Talense samples, that's this kind of um, big block uh, uh, right below my label uh, that's labeled Talense, uh, can have the variant that lets them digest the sugar lactose, which is this key sugar. Um, and so it's very, very rare in that time, just 3,200 years ago. Now look at the kind of larger block labeled medieval Bavaria that's less than 2,000 years later. In the blink of an evolutionary eye, almost 70% of that sample has at least one copy of that variant, and many of them have two, meaning that 70% of them were able to digest milk. That's lightning fast, but what's actually interesting is that today the proportion is even higher, about I think over 90% of modern Europeans, maybe even higher than that, can actually digest lactose in adulthood. So this is a really good example of a way that humanity is continuing to adapt very quickly to really, really drastic changes in its lifestyle. Um, so I want to, um, I think, you know, in the interest of time, I want to say, yeah, this is kind of a snapshot of the very, very recent past. But there's a lot of similar work going on right now to try to look at how genetic differences are accumulating even in humans today. I'll show you just a super quick example of that. I'm gonna like fly through my slide. Just focus on the chart here on the right. This group had the idea that they'd be able to see how genetic differences are, um, or how uh, the proportion of genetic differences is changing in a living snapshot of people from today. So this group of people that are represented in this particular chart were collected in the last 20 years. So these are people who are our contemporaries. Um, and what this group asked is, are there variants that are less common at certain ages or more common? On the idea that that's kind of a sign that we're continuing to be impacted by our genetic variation. One of the biggest signs that they found is that in particular, the variant that confers a huge risk for developing Alzheimer's becomes much less common in this population of healthy volunteers as you look at older and older people, suggesting that people who have that variant that causes a propensity towards Alzheimer's, especially as you can see um, at the kind of mean age of Alzheimer's onset, uh, start dropping out of that healthy population. So evolution's not done with us, is what I would say. Um, all right. So you can see it's still, it's still pretty challenging to look at the present with DNA. A lot of effects are really subtle, um, but I hope it's, you know, I hope this tour has kind of given you a sense of the kinds of questions that scientists can ask about human history without ever going back in time just by looking at our DNA. Um, what I think I'll do, because I imagine there will be a lot of questions after the next thing I say, <laughs> uh, is really quickly talk about our DNA in our future and then take questions after. Does that sound good? Excellent. Okay, so, all right, um, yeah. perfect. Mm. Okay, so now that we've arrived at the present, um, I wanna take this last part to turn towards the future. And I'm gonna say just a few things here because I imagine this is gonna set the stage for a lot of discussion. Um, and I really encourage people to ask questions and to participate. Um, so we can read our DNA, we can use it to understand our past and our present and our health. We're gaining the biotechnological power to change it. And I think we're at this really incredibly interesting moment in time where the floodgates of technology are just starting to open. Information's becoming more and more common and easier to access. And I think this moment shows a lot of promise, but it also has a lot of challenge and difficulty. Um, so I wanted to take a moment about to talk about some of those promises of the impact of DNA and some of the challenges that go alongside it. 
The first, which we've already alluded to, is the kind of paradox of genetic privacy, especially as it applies to forensics. Um, and I call it a paradox because I think as a society, we're holding in tension two things. The first is that people have a right to control their own data. And the second is that people have the right to protect, to hide their own data. That's really privacy. And the way in which this is a paradox has been really unmasked by the rise of forensic genealogy practice, which uses these kinds of publicly available genetic connections between family members to try to contextualize crime scene DNA. And this has been a really powerful tool for solving unsolved crimes, especially cold cases. And yet it unmasks this paradox, right? On the one hand, I have the complete right as the owner of my DNA to take my DNA sequence and put it on the internet. It's mine, right? It's the same as if I took a selfie and stuck it on Instagram, my photo, my choice. And yet, if I put up a photo of myself, my mom might say, oh, well, you and I have such similar faces and I don't wanna be on Instagram. So your face kind of looks like mine. I don't wanna be on it, so please take it down. And that argument wouldn't hold a lot of water. But if I put up my genome, the argument she made would be mathematically rigorous. 50% of my genome is my mother's. So do, do she and I have a 50% joint stake in the data? Does that mean my ancestors who had never heard of genomes can have their privacy rights violated by me? This is a super complex issue. And I think there's not a really clear leaning on what's going to happen around the regulation of the use of publicly available data for forensics because of this really complex underlying paradox. Okay, a second challenge that we face is the application of human genetics in medicine. There've been a lot of promises about the idea that we can use human genetics to explain disease and to treat it. And in many ways, they've actually been borne out, especially in the area of inheritable um, Mendelian diseases and cancer treatments. But the field is dealing with two big problems. Uh, the first, I really like this phrase, an article from a few years ago called it the case of the missing heritability, which I'll explain a little more simply. So when we study how genetic variation is associated with traits, we don't actually get all the answers from the mathematical methods we're using today to understand these subtle patterns. We thought if we asked the question, oh, you know, how come Natalie is five foot seven and her grandmother is five foot two, that we would find two, three, maybe four variants that explained the entire difference. But instead, and these are real numbers, we are finding tens of thousands of variants that don't even explain 50 or 60% of the genetic basis of different traits. So we really thought we could just decode genetic code as it is, and it turns out to be really complex to understand how these tiny variations are actually associated with human traits and disease. Even more challengingly, it turns out that our ways of decoding it are highly sensitive to other patterns in the DNA, especially to what population you're from. Remember that how far you are from Addis Ababa influences tremendously the diversity of your genome. So a, a particularly notable paper from a couple of years ago did a study that really highlighted what that means for understanding the genetic basis of a trait. They did a study of the genetic basis of height in Europeans, um, and then they predicted their heights based on the information they'd learned. So that's here in blue on the chart on the right. Um, and then they did the same for a bunch of individuals in other populations, thinking, great, we've learned having an A at this particular place makes you half a centimeter taller. Let's calculate out their heights, right? Nice try, except the predictions they made were completely wrong for those other populations. Europeans are not wildly taller than African-American populations represented here in red. Um, I've told you throughout this whole talk that the patterns we're learning off of are really, really subtle. And what that means is that many of our algorithms may be getting them wildly wrong. So on the one hand, we've kind of promised that we're going to be able to use your own DNA to understand your disease risk, to personalize treatments. But honestly, we're still at the point where we can barely use your DNA to understand your height, let alone more complex disease or behavioral traits. Last but really not least, I want to talk about the potential of genomic editing. Um, and because this is something that the news covers a lot, and I think ever since the first attempts at genomic editing in the early 90s, we've been promised that at any moment now we're going to have designer babies and the end of genetic disease. But think of all these pieces together in context. We're still only now 
working out the editing technology, even though it's won a Nobel Prize, and a paper published just a week and a half ago, literally October 29th, I was like reading papers for my regular day job. And then I was like, oh, I've got to include this in the talk. Um, so it demonstrated that in some cases, when you're trying to edit a variant in human embryos using CRISPR technology, instead of changing one base, you lose the entire chromosome. That is a really gnarly side effect in the search for a cure for genetic disease. So I hope that, you know, this particular piece of information in combination with our continued confusion about how any of your genetic variation actually modifies disease risk or even makes you a little taller and shorter actually tells you that the knowledge we need to really meaningfully reshape our own genomes is still very far in the distance. Um, so this has been just a really high level skim of some of the challenges and opportunities facing us as a society as we pursue human genetics. And I hope this surface level skim impresses on all of you how quickly things are moving and how rapidly we're learning, but also how many challenges we have left to face. So let me wrap up um, and then we can talk through all these issues. We have an incredibly unprecedented amount of new biotechnology on our hands that lets us read, decode, and even modify our own DNA. And this is enabling us not only to learn about the diseases of the present, but also about our history in the distant past. And there's an incredible amount of promise in this biotechnology revolution, but also a lot of challenge and difficulty ahead. So I want to end with a, a photo from my birding and bicycling hobby, which is about the only hobby I have uh, now that we're all pretty isolated, that I think captures things in a nutshell. Human genetics is in a moment of incredible potential. It has the potential to shape our understanding of our history, ourselves, our health, to transform our future. And we're really poised on the edge of an incredible amount of change. And I'm enthralled watching this revolution in biotechnology and statistics and machine learning happen at the same time, helping us decode this gold mine of information. But it's going to be a really tough and complicated road, and scientists are going to keep struggling to understand what the heck is happening right under our noses. Um, but personally, I'm really excited to get to peer into the vast abyss of what humanity doesn't know about itself yet and maybe try to shine a little corner of light on it for myself and hopefully for some of you in this talk. Uh, thank you all so much for listening and for letting me run over a little bit and I'm happy to take, I'm happy to take all the questions now. Good. Um... You just mentioned this. Uh, this has been excellent, and it's a, a, a fount of information. Uh, you just mentioned this CRISPR study, which said instead of sometimes making mistakes, you lose an entire gene, uh, an entire chromosome. Mm -hmm. So you end up with twenty-two instead of twenty-three. So um, yeah, uh, in this case, it's a little bit more complex. So specifically, what they were trying to do is introduce a change on one chromosome. Um, and what happens is um, the specific chromosome that you're trying to edit gets dropped. So like if, so we have 46 total chromosomes, which are 23 times two, one copy from each of our parents. Um, and so what ends up happening is you go from 46 to 45 with no successful edit. Um, this is not something that is viable for almost every single human chromosome. So it's a really, really huge error. And it's obviously something that's rare, um, but it is, a, it is a way in which, although we've understood the machinery, we still really don't understand the application. It's not something that happens every time, but it is something that occasionally happens. And it, it happens in a way that depends on which chromosome you're trying to edit. Wonderful. Uh, got a couple questions. Um... How does mitochondrial DNA fit in with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, mitochondrial DNA is another kind of DNA that we think of as part of our genome, but that's not exactly traditionally. It's, uh, it's the best way to say it. Uh, it's not part of our nuclear genome. So I kind of said, oh yeah, you know, the human genome lives in the nucleus, but as with all biological pieces of information, that's a half truth. Uh, so, um, there's a particular um, component of our cells, the mitochondria, which is responsible for a lot of energy generation. And uh, it's actually thought that it's descended from a bacterium that 
at some point a eukaryotic cell ingested. And one of the reasons that we think that is because it actually has its own little set of DNA that encodes proteins that are critical to its function and that are actually translated uh, and that are like generated from the DNA that's in the mitochondrion. So um, mitochondrial DNA is also a part of kind of our larger genome, but it's sort of an exception to a lot of the rules that I suggested. And it's also uh, only about 16,000 bases long. So it is still a really small component of all the information that lives inside our cells, but it's very interesting. Um, yeah, I actually, I guess, sorry, one particularly interesting thing to note about it is that it is almost always inherited only from uh, your mother because typically sperm don't contain mitochondria. So your mitochondria all descend from the mitochondria that were in the egg cell that you came from. And since your egg cell comes from your mom, that means your mitochondria typically come from there too. Although, as I said, as in all things uh, biologically related, that is a half truth at best. Okay, lots of half truths. That's interesting. <laughs> That's uh, biology. Eric, <laughs> Eric wanted to know where your bike path was. <laughs> That's a uh, um, that particular photo is from uh, the shoreline section of the Baylands Bike Trail. It's a very nice area. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one human uh, Carl asks one human chromosome is fused from what used to be two separate chromosomes. Do we know how long ago that happened? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'm trying to remember if that is true for all of the primates or just uh, humans. The, the way that we can typically tell what we start doing when we want to look further and further back in history is instead of looking at just DNA from the human population, we can start looking at DNA from our sister species. So one of the ways that we kind of try to time things like that is saying, well, was this fusion present in, or is this fusion present in chimpanzees and bonobos as well? Because if it is, then it was probably present at least by the time that we were all last one species, which is, um, depending on how you calculate it, you know, uh, I would put it at about 7 million years ago. But if you start kind of going out further into the space of comparative genomics, then instead of looking at patterns in one population, you start looking at patterns in multiple species. And we can use that usually to get a rough estimate of when history or when genomic history happened. But our picture gets a lot less clear in part because we only have modern representations of all of the organisms there. And that's likely to be a limitation of our technology. We don't think that DNA is stable for more than about a million years. So we're not going to be able to sequence fossils. Like we're, there, there are parts of history that will remain, uh, there, there are stones that will remain unturned. Excellent. Uh, if there are other questions, uh, please raise your hand or speak up. Um, I have about a dozen different questions ranging. Um, I, I was reading something about genetics of calico cats and um, Kleinfelt, it touched on Kleinfelter's syndrome and XXY. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole scheme seems to be remarkably error prone. Yeah, um, I, uh, <laughs> I own a, uh, a tortoise shell cat and um, Back when people used to come to my home, they were always like, do you own your cats as genetic teaching tools? Like, because I <laughs> persistently have cats with, or pets with interesting phenotypes. Um, but uh, I actually, so um, just as a really quick aside, um, one of the most fascinating things about humans is that all women have two X chromosomes, right? Or I would say all females have two X chromosomes. So um, what that means is that we have a double dosage of genes on the X chromosome. And we know that a double dosage of genes is not something that a cell tolerates. Like a Down syndrome or trisomy 21 comes from just having a 1.5 X dosage of a very, very, very small chromosome. Now the X chromosome is massive and we have twice as much of it as we need. So the, the very interesting consequence of that is that the cell has thought of no better thing 
than to just basically ball up and gum up one of the X chromosomes as tightly as possible so that it's illegible. And thereby we kind of maintain parity. So what does that have to do with cats? Well, um, the process is actually not stably maintained from cell to cell. So like in some of my cells, one of my X chromosomes is gummed up and in other cells, the other X chromosome is gummed up. In cats, their fur color is encoded on the X chromosome. So if you have a female cat and she has one X chromosome, which tells her she should be orange and the other X chromosome, which tells her that she should be black, then the places where her cells have gummed up the black X chromosome, she'll only be orange. And at the other places, she'll only be black, which is how you get these kind of like interesting calico patterns. Mm -hmm. But it's like a, it's a totally wild solution to a huge fundamental problem. And, a, you know, it's kind of like the middle schoolers solution to cleaning their room. Like, oh, this shouldn't <laughs> be in here. The best thing I can do is just gum it up and stick it in a drawer. Like, anyway, very, yeah. The genetic closet. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Uh, we, we are actually over time, and I think this has been marvelous. Um, if we have any uh, final questions, uh, be happy to take them. Um, please speak up. Um, otherwise, no, go ahead, Sue. Yeah. Does that, is that the reason why that multicolor seems to occur only in female cats? Yeah, um, that, that is why um, it only occurs in them because they have two X chromosomes. That said, there are very rare calico male cats that have two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. Y. So yeah, at, at least um, it, so uh, maleness is determined not actually by the presence of a Y chromosome, but just by the presence of one gene that's on the Y chromosome. So if you have a Y chromosome and you're missing this gene, you will be phenotypically female. So in cats, like occasionally you can get these like really unusual males that are calico because they have that gene, but like transplanted onto a different chromosome by accident, or because they have a Y chromosome in addition to the two X chromosomes, but they're all exceptionally rare. So most of the time when you meet a multicolored cat, that's going to be a, a female cat. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's it, we're lucky Mendel didn't uh, didn't study cats instead of peas. We really are. It's surprising how many things he discovered are like totally not true in complex systems, but happen to be really nicely true about sweet peas specifically. So I want to thank you very much for this. Has been outstanding. And uh, a round of applause for Natalie Tellis. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much.